One of the big differences that we often talk about in the difference between Judaism and Christianity is that Christianity teaches proselytization. Christians proselytize. They go out and they seek converts. They seek people to enter into the faith and they search them out to spread the message. And Judaism, on the other hand, traditionally, we're told, doesn't proselytize. We don't seek others to convert. We don't have a belief that you have to be Jewish to be saved, to go to heaven, that you have to be Jewish to live a good or a moral life, but that it's the commandments, the mitzvot, the laws, the rituals, the wisdom for us, for the Jews. And that those born in other faiths and other cultures and other societies have their own rules and their own ways to go by. Jews don't proselytize. But if you look at our text, even though the idea is that we don't, there's actually an idea that we do. It goes all the way back to Avraham Avinu, Abraham, the very first Jew, the very first Yid. Famously, according to our tradition, he went out to spread awareness of God to the people. The Torah says that he left for the land of Canaan from his home, not with only his family, but also et nefesh asher asu, all of the souls that he had acquired. The Midrash tells us it's not those that he acquired, it's those that he made, those that he converted to Judaism, those that he brought awareness to God and awareness to our tradition to. Jewish tradition does believe, to some degree, in proselytizing. Chabad gets this. And if we're talking about numbers alone, they might be more successful than Abraham. But for them, it's not proselytizing to those outside, but to Jews. Spreading awareness of God and our tradition to Jews who have lost their way. In fact, to spread awareness of Judaism is a commandment, according to Rambam, Maimonides. Leo quoted him earlier for something else, but he wrote a lot. 12th century rabbi, philosopher, doctor, and more. He tells us that the mitzvah, to cause others to love God, is a commandment. And you actually should know that commandment. Because we say it twice a day in our service. You shall love the Lord your God. And Rambam says under that commandment, it's not just that you should love the Lord your God, but you should cause others to love God as well through your actions and through your deeds. And this is related to another mitzvah that happens in our parsha today. In the text it says, V'nikdashti betok v'nei Yisrael. God says, I will be sanctified among the children of Israel. And in this source, this idea of sanctification, comes the Jewish idea of a kiddush Hashem, doing an act which sanctifies God's name. We often talk about, in rabbinic literature and in the world, this idea of Kiddush Hashem in the extreme. It's often talked about as martyrdom. There are three mitzvot that the rabbis teach that we're supposed to choose to be killed rather than to violate. Everything else, pekuach nefesh, saving a life puts off. But there are three mitzvot that we're not supposed to violate and instead allow our lives to be taken if someone puts a gun to our head for us. And the rabbis tell us that is a Kiddush Hashem sanctification of God's name, to die rather than violate those three mitzvot. But this idea of Kiddush Hashem goes further than that, even if that's where we often end the conversation, the extreme. This mitzvah is more than a source of martyrdom. It is the foundational command for how we should live our lives each and every day as Jews. The foundational command. It's not about a final moment of ultimate faith, but a Kiddush Hashem is something we should be doing each and every day. Every time we go out into the world and we live according to the ethics and values of the Torah, every action that we take that embodies the values of our tradition, in doing so we perform a Kiddush Hashem. We sanctify God's name. Velo techalalu et shem kodsho, kodshi. You shall not desecrate my holy name, God says. The opposite of a Kiddush Hashem. Hilul Hashem, a desecration of God's name, 
In the Talmud, the rabbis ask, what is this idea of desecrating God's name? What qualifies as a chilul Hashem? We can all think of extreme examples. When someone who's Jewish famously gets arrested, God forbid when there's a scandal with a rabbi or a cantor or a clergy member, scandal with a synagogue, these are things that are a Hilul Hashem. But it's not just these big moments and moral failings and moments of publicity that are desecration of God's name. The Talmud doesn't bring up only extreme examples. They're obvious. They're too easy. In the Talmud, when the rabbis ask, what is a desecration of God's name, one of the rabbis answers, if I were to take meat from the butcher and not pay immediately, even though he was going to pay, even though it was with the butcher's permission that he would buy the meat on credit and pay later, if there was a chance that others in the shop might see him taking the meat and leaving and think, there goes that Jew that just stole some meat, the Hilul Hashem, the rabbi says. If for a moment others might think you're doing the wrong thing, even when you're doing the right, we have to be above reproach. That's the Talmudic answer. And this answer, this question is dealt with many times in our tradition. I want to look at a couple other examples. From the Hasidic master, Rabbi Nachman Bar Yitzach. Sorry. Not in the Hasidic source. That from Rabbi Nachman Bar Yitzach, another Talmudic rabbi, he says, it's one for whom people say, may God forgive them for their sins, for their actions. And another rabbi in the Talmud, Rabbi Abayah, cites the commandment to love God and to cause God's name to be loved by others as a result. He says that's the opposite of a chilul Hashem. To cause others to be loved by God as a result. And when you do a chilul Hashem, you're doing anything that causes others to turn away from God. It's one who doesn't deal honestly or speak pleasantly with others. But they do that with a kippah on their head. But they do it after coming home from davening. It's a chilul Hashem, according to the Talmud. It's not only important to know, but I think it's interesting and fascinating that this teaching ends with an emphasis on one who violates a mitzvah, not a big mitzvah that we think about today like Shabbat or Kashrut. Chilul Hashem isn't eating a cheeseburger. A chilul Hashem is mistreating others. We might think, surely there are more important mitzvot that would be a desecration of God's name. The rage today is to talk about the sin of intermarriage. But that's not the question the rabbis bring up. It's about treating others poorly. It's about the ethics of the things we do when there isn't an explicit commandment that the rabbis focus in on in the Talmud for a chilul Hashem. If one's actions as a Jew leave others to believe that Judaism permits you or even encourages and causes your moral failings, it's a chilul Hashem, a desecration. The Rambam, again, Maimonides codifies this in his law code as anything which leads to a murmuring. And the more religious a person is seen to be by others, the higher the bar for their actions must be, the greater risk that someone's perceptions of them might lead to harming God's reputation in the eyes of others, rather than causing them to love God. And we see this all too often when there appear to be a conflict between halakha as it has been passed down in our ethical intuitions today. Reason and logic are often said to be not a part of the halakhic conversation. What's ethical is what is commanded. But I believe that's not true. I believe the system is built for the law to develop based on our moral knowledge. After all, our moral knowledge, our reason, our logic, these are tools that God gave us. We say it every day in the Amidah. You grace humanity with knowledge. You teach us understanding. Grace us with knowledge and understanding and discernment. These come from God. These are holy things. And the rabbis of the past, the great leaders and teachers of our tradition, those who passed the Torah down from one generation to the next, they knew this. They recognized reason not as a danger to Torah, but as a tool to better understand Torah, to keep Torah living, to bring God into the world. In each generation, rabbis and leaders were brave enough not to hide behind Torah when their ethical knowledge progressed, but confronted the moral issues of the day and reinterpreted them, applied the law to address the ethical concerns of the world they found themselves in. 
one of the reasons is to do otherwise would be a chilul Hashem, desecration of God's name. To act against what is common decency in our world, because a book tells us to, is a chilul Hashem. And that's what these rabbis recognize. The leaders who abolished an eye for an eye in favor of justice rather than violent retribution. These rabbinic leaders of the Talmud who reinterpreted the laws of capital punishment so those who violated Shabbat or committed adultery or even blasphemed God were not put to death. Because to do so would have been a chulul Hashem. And when the Torah law that was meant to help poor people, the elimination of debt instead caused people not to lend money around the sabbatical year lest the debts be forgiven and they not be repaid. So the poor suffered. A rabbi stood up to address the problem, lest the Torah cause the Chilul Hashem. And the same is true today when it comes to issues of egalitarianism, inclusion, the LGBTQ community, and others. There are leaders who have stood up, who have demanded that Torah not be used to desecrate God's name. They didn't hide behind a blind faith in God's law, but they used their God-given moral reasoning to ensure that the Torah upheld our moral and ethical standards. Reason is not the enemy of religion. There are those that like to say, if you don't have morality based in law that is never changing, anything can become moral. Reason is the enemy of morality, some claim. And the biggest example people like to quote is looking at secular societies and governments, totalitarian nations and rulers. Maybe in our own memory, an easy example is the Nazis. But the Nazis are not an example of a lack of blind faith. They're not an example of too much reason and rationality. In fact, on the belt buckles, the Nazi soldiers said, God meet un, God is with us. It was religion blindly applied, faith without reason, that led to those murders. Reason is not an enemy in our world. And there are rabbis in our world today, rabbis such as David Hartman, who called out those in orthodoxy, who acknowledged that agunot, women whose husbands refused to give them a gift, a Jewish divorce, were suffering, but said that even though the law caused them pain, it was impossible to change because it was God's law. Rabbi Hartman said no. It's not fair. Rabbis like Yosef Konevsky, who stood up to the Orthodox Union when they said, hiring female clergy is wrong. It goes against our values. It goes against Judaism. Rabbi Konevsky stood up and said his soul was going to do it anyway. And they could kick him out if they wanted. It was the right thing to do. There used to be many more rabbis like that. Rabbis like Daniel Landis, who said that being gay doesn't preclude someone from loving God and serving the people as a rabbi. There used to be rabbis in the conservative movement like that. It was founded by them. Rabbis who used the best moral knowledge of their time to understand God's will to bring others to love God. But today, we have far too many rabbis and institutions who simply leave it at this is what the law says. There's nothing I can do. And a great response they often bring is, why should we care how others think of us? Why should we care how someone who isn't Jewish judges Judaism? Because this is our rule. This is our laws. This is what God commanded us. Well, I point them to Moses. When he stood up to God and God was angry over the people's building of the golden calf, the golden idol, and God wanted to hurt the Jewish people in his anger and his wrath, Moses stood up and said, what would the Egyptians think if you do this now? If you bring the Israelites out of Egypt only to punish them this severely now? Moses said we should care even what the Egyptian taskmaster thought of us. God was convinced by that argument, shouldn't we? We should care what others think about Torah. If it matters, what the impression the Egyptians had over Torah, all the more so the impression we give our fellow Jews. 
I talked to so many young Jews today who were put off from synagogues and other Jewish institutional institutions in their life, from the rituals, because they see our tradition as embodying a set of values that they don't understand, they don't relate to. Not speaking for equality, not speaking for inclusion of those who have different needs and abilities, not speaking to them. That's a chilul Hashem. We give a Jew the impression that Judaism doesn't speak to those values. It's a chilul Hashem. Every time someone thinks that in order to be a good Jew, they have to leave and suspend their moral reasoning at the door, it's a chilul Hashem, a desecration of God's name. Anything that leads to murmuring, that gives the next generation the impression that to be a good Jew means you have to violate your ethical intuition or choose between them. Sechilu Hashem. It is driving Jews away faster and faster from our communities and from God and from Torah. Blind faith isn't going to save Judaism. It'll destroy it. I want to leave you with a final thought. The page of Talmud where the question of what is a Sechilu Hashem comes up, it comes following a discussion of various sins and what atones for them. If a person violates a positive commandment, a command to perform an action, like prayer, for example, or to light Shabbat candles, the Talmud tells us that if they repent, they are immediately forgiven. But the Talmud goes on and says if a person violates a negative mitzvah, one of the prohibitions, like don't eat milk and meat together, if they repent, their punishment is suspended. And on Yom Kippur, it atones for their sin. A person violates one of the big sins, one of the ones punishable by death. Repentance and Yom Kippur suspend their punishment. Suffering, the Talmud says, provides atonement. But one who has caused the desecration of God's name, repentance has no power to suspend the punishment. Yom Kippur does not atone. Suffering does not atone. Nothing fixes a Chilul Hashem. It's something that we must answer for when we stand before our maker. There is no greater sin than turning others away from God. Whether those outside of our tradition, outside of our communities, or those within it. We have to be conscious of how our actions are perceived by others. And we have to act in a way that keeps God not just here in our sanctuaries, but spreads God out into the world. To Jews that have lost their past, I'm not talking about proselytizing beyond to others, converting them to Judaism, but teaching them that to love God is to love each other. We're supposed to be an or legoyim, a light unto the nations. And if what we do only rests in here in our sanctuary and doesn't spread out there, we haven't done our job. Shabbat shalom.